And thanks again for joining us. Um, we are just going to reset the stage to start the next panel discussion to further dive deeper into uh, the nexus of gender and climate. Um, and we are fortunate to have an esteemed group of panelists. Um, and we also have one joining us online. So this will be a hybrid session. Um, but we're really excited to dive deeper into uh, the topics that Dami Lola and Lisa were just discussing um, on the opportunities to increase energy access to power a high uh, energy and high growth future, um, especially these opportunities um, that uh, women and girls can benefit from um, and, and moving beyond just the, the small solar lamps um, and calling that a successful uh, energy access uh, project, but really exploring the opportunities to um, build energy systems that can power a, a refrigerator um, and more. Um, and w I think we'll have yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, and then and then also just increasing the representation of the energy sector as well, um, both on the policy side, but also the technical side. Um, and it has been really fun and exciting to be able to work on this International Women's Day programming at the Atlantic Council for this, um, to be able to really highlight the, the women leading the charge on this front. So without further ado, I'm going to sit down and introduce our panelists. Okay, and I think my mic is still working. Um, so we are fortunate to be joined by uh, Jacqueline Musitwa, Senior Climate Finance Advisor at USAID. Um, Sia Novroji, Senior Director, Girls and Women's Strategy at the United Nations Foundation. Renata Koch Alvarenga, Founder and Executive Director of Empodera Clima. And joining us virtually will be Sarah Barton, uh, Director of Women and Girls Equality uh, from the Clinton Global Initiative. And you, Sarah, you can't see inside the room, but you are, your face is around all these screens. So uh, we can see you. Hi, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Um, so Sia, to kick us off, I wanted to turn to you. Um, can you share how women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate change and the broader societal implications of, of this impact? Sure. Thank you, Maya, and thank you so much for inviting us. Um, the Girls and Women's Strategy team at UN Women is always excited to go anywhere and talk about how gender equality is linked to every single issue in the world, um, and certainly climate change is, is right up there. Um, climate change essentially exacerbates the vulnerabilities that girls and women face due to gender equality and sexism, basically. So there are some very specific ways. I mean, you heard about many of them in the fireside chat earlier, um, but girls and women bear an unequal responsibility for securing food um, in many countries and regions. Um, women make up the majority of the agricultural workforce. Um, securing water for households, securing energy for households. And when, the, when access to those resources is impacted by climate events and climate change, women and girls have to work harder. They have to travel further. They also have to do without. As Damilola said, it's often women and girls who eat last. It's often mothers who will sacrifice themselves so that their children and their families can eat. Um, so just a direct link to access to resources um, and girls' and women's well-being. Um, girls and women also bear an undue responsibility for care in the family, looking after the most vulnerable, children, the elderly. Um, and so when there are crises and when there is disruption that, that um, disrupts lives, those burdens grow. And again, it is girls and women who look after themselves last. It's families who look after girls and women's last, last as well. Um, also, with barriers to mobility, girls and women really face when there is disruption, when there is migration, they are often the last to leave communities. It's often the hardest, it's hardest for them to relocate, to reset up their lives, to reset up sources of livelihoods. So these are really specific ways. Um, in terms of health and well-being, there are some very specific impacts. Increases in temperature, humidity, um, rainfall create favorable conditions for the spread of vector-borne diseases, which can cause miscarriages, premature births, and anemia. Um, girls and women have been found. There's now research showing that they're more likely to experience stress and mental health impacts related to the stresses of climate change than boys of men, boys and men. Um, and we heard from Damilola just now, the threat of gender-based violence increases whenever there is increased 
um, risk. So during disruption and dislocation, violence against girls and women increases, whether it is the threat of rape when they are collecting water and firewood and having to go further and further, whether it is violence in the home, an increase, we're seeing increases in child marriage, human trafficking as well. Um, there's just one other way I'd like to um, highlight the way that climate change, and this is sort of the broader societal implications, Maya, that you mentioned. Climate change, like other global issues, really puts the spotlight on patriarchy and how girls and women continue to be excluded from the spaces where we need to be part of the decisions because of things um, that directly impact us. Um, so what does it mean to not see yourself at the table? You know, I grew up in Kenya. I grew up with a role model, Wangari Maathai. Um, so my reality was that women can lead in this space and women are talking about sustainability and human rights and harmony between communities and the earth. Um, but I fear even with Greta Thunberg out in the world that many girls don't have that privilege. Um, we saw recently the incredibly embarrassing photograph of the Azerbaijani COP planning committee, all men. How, how does this happen today? Like, which public affairs team did not review this properly and, and put a stop to it, right? So whether it's, whether it's by neglect or whether it's intentional, um, it's, it's a reminder that patriarchy persists, that real harm can be done. Um, you know, I think Demi Lola said this excuse of we don't know any women is just, it's not acceptable anymore. Um, and there's a real impact to that exclusion as well, right? So we know that women's representational in national and global climate negotiation, negotiating bodies remains below 30%. It's not acceptable. We are missing the perspectives, the energy, the creativity, and the realities of half of the human family. How can that be and with an issue that's so critical to our survival? Um, and then practically, we also know that just 3% of philanthropic funding um, around the environment goes to girls' and women's activism. So we can and we have to do better. Thanks so much. And um, Renata, I wanted to turn to you to, to kind of build on that. Um, how are these, are the, is the impact of climate change um, further worsening um, or, or disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable communities, especially, especially in the global south? Thank you, and it's great to be here. I definitely am always honored and don't take these places for granted because I think as someone from the civil society space, from Brazil, from the global south, it's not always that you get to, to be in such powerful rooms, right, such as in Washington DC with people from the government, from the UN, but it makes a difference, right? We're right, we're, we're beyond the, the closed door conversations. And I think um, when we think about the global south, we all face climate change, right? We're all impacted by um, the effects of climate, by hurricanes, droughts, floods. But in countries that are more vulnerable, of course, you're gonna feel it more, right? And there's this, this interesting um, dynamic where the countries that were most responsible for causing climate change, the US, a bunch of countries in Europe, are not the ones bearing most of the costs nowadays. I work a lot in the Caribbean as well, and you see that first and foremost, right? You see small islands that did not even get the chance to, 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 to reach perhaps a level of economic development that would even consider them to have a level of impact that equates to um, these global north countries, but now they're having to stop all of that because the, the, the disasters are reaching them, but at the same time, it, they're the ones that are not able to go beyond and go further and reach the developed space. So when we think about women and girls specifically in the global south, I of course think about the vulnerability that you already mentioned. I think that's very clear. But I do want to touch on a point which is about the representation of it. Of course, women in the global south are more impacted. You can think about indigenous peoples in the Amazon, in the Brazilian Amazon, for example. But they are and have been for centuries at the forefront of the leadership to, to, to act on climate, right? But you don't see that represented in the COPs, for example. I've been, I've been attending the COP spaces since I was 18 years old, back in COP21, when the Paris Agreement was, was adopted. And you know, even though gender and climate was already a big topic then, I guess I say already, even though it's, it's, it's recent in the climate negotiations, but I think since then we've seen 
how much more this is happening, how much more conversations we're having around gender and climate, such as this one today. But you don't see these people that are most in fact impacted, that are on the front lines of um, the forests or the peripheries or the favelas, whatever it is, you, a lot of the times, maybe we'll see them uh, in the civil society spaces, you'll see them being activists, but you don't often see them as the decision makers. And that's not because there are no women or because they're not competent, because they are. There's so many brilliant people leading the charge already all over the global south. I can speak a little bit for Latin America, but all over really. But at the same time, you don't see these people being able to make the decisions because of the systemic patriarchy systems that we live in, right? So even though they are the most impacted, you see all of the same issues that women all over the world are facing, women being the majority of the world's poor, women uh, being the, the, the group most targeted for gender-based violence. You don't see that reflected in the solutions, right? And the stats are clear. We've talked about it in the other panel as well, about how when we do have more women, but especially uh, young women, black women, indigenous women in boardrooms, in the COP negotiations, you have better agreements. And so I personally think that one of the reasons that we don't really have that so far, we, we are really far behind where we need to be on ambition for climate action, for climate justice, is because we don't have the diversity reflected in the boardrooms, in the decision-making space. And so the Global South, again, a really powerful uh, um, groups of women that you see, really powerful feminist coalitions that for centuries, for decades, have been doing the hard work. But I think what's missing is really the access to these spaces, the tools to access these spaces, the training, which we can talk more about, the, the actual um, formal capacity building that the UN, for example, should provide instead of just opening up some, some slots to attend the climate negotiations, right? The language as well. So there's so many factors that are putting Global South, civil society, Global South, women, young women behind. But there's so many tools already available to change that. So I hope we can encourage that a lot more moving forward. Great, thanks so much. And I forgot to mention this at the top, but if you wanted to join into the conversation and ask a question, feel free to drop a question at askac.org and I'll see it pop up here on the iPad. Um, uh, but Sarah, I wanna turn to you next um, and then we'll, we're talking about all the impacts first and then we'll go into the solutions and really um, uh, an action-oriented approach to kind of address these disparities. Um, but Sarah, I wanted to um, turn to you to, to have you elaborate a little bit more on um, the, the impacts of extreme heat on um, on women and girls as well. I know our colleagues at the Resilience Center um, work closely with Clinton Global Initiative to um, to shed light on this issue and this challenge. And so, um, wanted to to turn to you to see if you had any thoughts on um, on the the direct impacts of extreme heat um, to women and girls. Sure, um, and thank you for having us. We are delighted to work with the Atlanta Council on a commitment that they made last year around creating um, a, a very innovative microfinance pool uh, that is piloted in several countries, including um, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, to look at investing in women as uh, as climate both solution uh, solution drivers and also as people who are disproportionately affected. So we know that extreme heat has a disproportionate impact on a on, on women uh, and girls in a range of ways. Um, and I think that it's been referenced in a couple of the, the sort of contextual um, reflection so far, but it affects both drought and floods have an extreme impact on uh, on women and girls. It drives displacement. It drives uh, an inability to provide effectively for families th through um, their sort of livelihood generation, compromising both their uh, their the, the infrastructure around their homes and their fam families and communities. Um, it has an impact on girls going to school, which the disruption in girls' education um, is is an ongoing problem in many different ways around the world. So I would say, in addition to increasing the risk of vector-borne illnesses, which was referenced before, in addition to increasing the risk of displacement, um, and 80%, I think an estimated 80% of, uh, of people affected by, uh, uh, disproportionately by, um, by climate change for in, from the perspective of displacement are women and girls, 
from the perspective of affecting and impacting their livelihoods, and also from a perspective of driving uh, reduced agricultural output, um, reduced ability to uh, maintain construction, and that's true both in urban and rural areas. Uh, there are such a big range of ways in which extreme heat is really driving um, health impacts, economic impacts, safety impacts, um, and the, the sort of general uh, environment in which the enabling environment in which uh, women and girls need to both survive and also um, something we like to talk about, be empowered to be the frontline solution solvers that we are solution drivers, I should say, that we know that they are. Great, thanks so much. So now that we have all been uh, caught up on the same page about what the problem is, um, Jacqueline, I wanted to turn to you um, in your role as at USAID, um, if you could share about um, USAID's strategy in, in ensuring that gender considerations are included and mainstreamed in, in your guys' climate programming, especially since you're working in the countries that are most impacted by climate change. Thank you, Maya, and thanks for the opportunity to to share at least what, what we're doing at USAID. I think to sum it up, it's, uh, I'll put it kind of under the context of three Vs. Uh, one, trying to reduce vulnerability and violence. Um, two, really trying to make sure that we are giving the right women the voice to one, express the concerns, the challenges that they're experiencing. Um, but also give them a voice to be able to, you know, communicate through the development process solutions that they think are, are, are most applicable to them. And then three is also taking the time to step back and really celebrate some of our victories. It's hard, it's challenging, uh, but I think it is also important for us to really acknowledge the progress that we are continuing to make. I think just to put it into context, um, we, in two, uh, 2022, uh, we, up, uh, we updated our climate strategy. And within the climate strategy, I think two areas I think are like of importance for this conversation are one, um, our focus on inclusion and really working on improving access to climate solutions, including climate finance for the most vulnerable women, girls for sure, but also indigenous people. Another aspect that is really important around our work and this nexus of kind of climate and all of the development we're working, we're doing is our localization strategy. Making sure that we set targets for when USAID will um, really work to include more of a voice, but also funding to local partners. What does that look like? Our goal by 2025 is to ensure that about 25% of our funding is actually in the hands of partners in the countries we operate in. And then by 2030, 50% um, of decision-making authority and funding is held in, in, in our partners' hands. Why is that important? It shifts the development paradigm as we know it. Typically, it has been the case that donor partners set the terms, and then the partners we work with say, okay, yes, no, um, and that's how development has been, has been defined. And so with this climate strategy, with the um, localization strategy, what we're trying to do is really kind of bring the voice of the people who are living in the communities we're working with um, to the fore. Another aspect that you know, I'd like to highlight is our 2023 Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Policy. Once again, a refresh of policy that had existed, but really pushing our agency to do more on gender and really to mainstream gender into all of the work we do. How does that end up playing out in programming? Um, it looks like um, several things. My team in particular, um, the climate finance team, through a mechanism we call the Climate Finance for Development Accelerator, um, work together with Amazon, so AWS, to create the Climate Gender Equity Fund. And we came up with CGEF in part recognizing that a lot of the money within the climate space is not going to women founders and or women-led institutions. And so the question we wanted to pose and what we really wanted to solve for is how can we bring in private sector partners to do more to actually fund uh, women-led organizations? I think another part that is quite important in our work, especially in the energy work that we do, um, through Power Africa is making sure that women are at the vo are at the table and do have a voice. 
part of it is skills building and training for women in very technical areas, such as engineering, but also making sure at a leadership level, we do support industry to further diversify. And we think that's important because as my colleagues have mentioned, until you have women in decision-making authorities, and also coming um, w up with the products that are relevant to solve these problems, I think we still have um, potential gaps in impact. Two other ways that I think is also quite important to highlight is the digital divide. You know, we see the proliferation of very important and pivotal technologies around the world, whether it is within the climate space or financial services. And for us, it's imperative for women to really be part of the product creating solution, uh, but also really to make sure that we decrease the divide. So we are working through our financial services team, as well as through what's called Development Innovation Ventures, which is a part of USAID that helps fund uh, early stage and startup companies to make sure that we are putting money into these types of businesses, really not only to pilot, but also to scale their solutions. Uh, the last two I'll mention is one on gender-based violence, uh, definitely an unfortunate challenge within all of our communities, uh, not only in the developing countries we work in, but also a challenge here in the U.S., where we are dedicating programming towards uh, working with communities on gender-based violence through our support to civil society. For us, civil society is definitely an important tool for implementation of a lot of our programs, but that doesn't go on its own. We also think it's important to engage with our partner countries to make sure that we work on policy solutions that also have a wider effect on, um, on people um, within the countries we're working in. So we work at the macro, we work at the micro, but really I think the main takeaway um, should be that USAID is integrating uh, work with gender in all of our programming. Great, thanks so much, Jacqueline. And Renana, I wanted to turn back to you on the capacity building uh, piece and ensuring active participation um, across the, uh, the decision, I almost said value chain, I've been <laughs> in the energy space too long, <laughs> across the decision making process. Um, and so I think um, turning to you again on, um, given your experience attending and being part of the COP since you were 18, um, how have you been, um, engaging with other colleagues around your age and the younger generation to um, be part of the, the climate policy making process um, and, and especially um, young, young girls and young women? Great question. Um, I think the, the youth participation in these climate decision making spaces like the COPs has been a long time coming. There's been young people for decades trying to access these spaces, uh, doing protests outside, whatever they could do to really be there, to have that transparency, that access. It is changing, right? Since I started attending COP back in 2015 to now, you do see some countries are, for example, including youth negotiators within their diplomatic teams uh, to have a say in what's actually being discussed and what point of view they're gonna bring, what strategies they're gonna bring. Of course, not enough countries. Uh, so, so definitely still advocating for that. Because even though sometimes we can get into those spaces, the COP is very clearly divided um, between uh, the, the parties, the governments, the diplomats, and the civil society, the media, academia. So there's very clear spaces, I would say, for each stakeholder, which I don't think it's how we're gonna solve climate change, right? We need to all be together in those spaces. And I think y you have seen how COP has become not only a negotiation, there's so many other stakeholders that are joining, but what parts of the negotiations or of that conference are they in, right? Um, COP28 just now in Dubai showcased that. It was this very large venue, and I saw a lot of really amazing, brilliant people from honestly places that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't always see there, which was awesome. It was really exciting to just see people from all kinds of, of background accessing the UN and being in privileged spaces, but then they're there. They go all the way to Dubai, they fundraise, what do they do there, right? How do they get through the actual policy making being done? And I think that is happening little by little, but clearly not fast enough. And so with young people, that's why I always mention uh, th this, this need for more training, for more access, 
I talk a lot about language with my organization in Podera Clima. I literally started to bring the gender and climate agenda to Latin America to translate content to Portuguese, to Spanish, to French, because that's the first thing. In Brazil, 1% of people speak fluent English. How do you get through this major, massive country you know, in, in, to understand the climate negotiations? We have COP30 coming up next year, and I think that will be uh, perhaps a, a, big, uh, a big step towards including more of the global south, towards having cops in places that are more accessible, easier, maybe not easier to get to, but um, I don't know, maybe there's some more access or even some more solidarity within the global south to speak to each other even if you don't speak the same language. Right, so that's, that's what I hope for, for young people's participation, but we need everyone involved. We need uh, high level decision makers, people that are in positions of privilege, including myself over the past few years have been able to access this space, but I can't come alone, right? I can't go to spaces, have this experience, leave it for myself. It is my duty, my responsibility to go back home and tell people about it, make content about it, write about it. And I think more people should do that so that we can diversify the spaces and therefore get more feminist solutions, get more ambitious solutions, just better solutions overall. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for folks um, at your age who are uh, trying to get more involved. Um, do you have any advice on how to work with uh, some of the older generations? That's a difficult question. I think. Um, you know, everyone can be involved in the climate space, right? I think a lot of people see the Greta, right? Or, or people speaking at the United Nations and then they, they think that that's the only way to do climate activism or attending a protest, which are really good ways to do it. But there's so much more that, that you can do. You can um, speak your words through art, through poetry, through music. There's so many things that each person can do. And I think when you're doing something you love, which I know sounds cheesy, but it's important, right? If we're gonna work on the climate space, which is very intense and difficult, and you're seeing all these disasters and all these bad news, you're gonna need to do something that you like doing, right? And so my advice would be first find something that you enjoy doing that gives you uh, passion, that brings you joy, and then through that, that will shine, I hope, through the older generations that you belong in that space, you should be there. But of course, it's not only the merit, because that is there, right? Good people are out there. We need the older generations, the people in power to pull us into these spaces and advocate for us as well. Great, thanks so much for sharing. And Sia, um, I wanna to turn to you on if you could share um, any best practices or how you've seen um, programs successfully engage with women um, in, in programming, women and girls in programming um, and, and building that capacity to ensure that they are, um, they do have a seat at the table. Thank you so much, Maya. And yeah, I was getting very excited listening to Renata. <laughs> so speaking as someone on the other side of the generational spectrum, I just wanted to share that one of the things that UN Foundation is doing is we are increasingly seeing youth on paper being involved in the multilateral space. And there's a recognition around issues like climate, gender equality, that literally the future is here and we can no longer ignore youth and we have to open doors, we have to make sure they're at the table. Um, and what we also found and were hearing from our youth partners was that there was a fair amount of tokenization. So yes, we were being flown in, brought to the table, but not actually listened to. We were being interrupted when a more important delegate had to speak or an official had to speak. Um, and I just wanted to share, if you haven't read um, the Young Feminist Manifesto, that is kind of the roadmap to inclusion in the multilateral space. Um, and so we were trying to think, what can we do as, um, as a privileged organization, as a skewing older uh, organization, and one that has access to the multilateral space. Um, and so we've designed what we're calling a bridge building um, methodology, where we brought youth activists together with other stakeholders in the multilateral space. And we're finding it crosses across all issues, but climate and gender equality are two issues where youth leadership is really rising to the surface. Um, so we try and create these spaces and partly to break down some of the silos that Renata 
mentioned, but also this question of how do you get different generations to speak to each other? How can older activists who understand and also have more access to these spaces share the lessons they've learned, the mistakes that we've made, and how can we learn to listen and make space for younger activists? And similarly, how can younger activists learn to listen and learn and understand these spaces and share what they know and their wisdom in a way that is is moving everything towards the progress that we want to see. So we're learning. We're, we're not there. It's a work in progress. But I think it's actually critical. And, and a key part of that work is also creating joy within those spaces, joy and connection, because Renata is right. You can't do this work unless you are inspired and unless you are energized and continually re recharged, because this is exhausting work, right? We're seeing the planet burn. <laughs> we're seeing people getting hurt every day, you know, and we're seeing the connections between these things. So to create spaces where across generations, across issues, we can come together and bolster each other and help each other in this activism, um, I think is crucial. Thanks yeah. so much for sharing. And in order to enable uh, most of these things that we're talking about, um, that's when financing comes into play. Um, so Sarah, I wanted to turn to you first on um, if you could share more about the role of um, private and public sector financing to integrate gender, gender considerations into um, funding decisions um, to be able to overcome these challenges that we've been, we've been discussing here. Sure. Um, I would say, I, I'll just as a way of, of introducing the what CGI brings to this, um, we see ourselves as a convener that really focuses on action. Um, we like to say that we focus on what we can do today, tomorrow, and in the future. We really try to bring together multi-stakeholder groups to develop together and then to amplify and support one another's work to address the world's most pressing challenges. And increasingly, we see the nexus points between organizations and, uh, and also among these intersecting issue areas, which has been referenced repeatedly, I'm very glad to hear, because that is also our, our approach to this. Um, we see the importance of partnership. So we do a lot of public-private partnership um, engagement and interaction, and I would say there's some positives. Uh, it was already referenced at the beginning of this session that uh, less than 3% of philanthropic investment goes into women and girls-led um, uh, work. And then there's the IFC, I think, estimated that only 7% of total private equity and venture funding in emerging markets is targeted to female-led businesses in this space. So there's definitely a big gap. And there are in particular, you know, we see in international financing mechanisms, there haven't been um, the kinds of, of kind of benchmarks that would potentially help to accelerate um, or, or incentivize in some ways uh, greater investment. But where that can change is when we talk about public-private partnerships. And that when I say that's where it can change, I, can, I mean, that is one way for us to accelerate progress quickly. Um, another, and I'll reference this in a moment, is around identifying uh, particularly smaller local-led organizations and efforts that are already doing this. They're, they're on the ground. They're saying, we can't wait. Um, we have to really be uh, pushing this forward right now. Uh, but first, on the sort of corporate engagement side, I think one of the things that our community is telling us is, for in large part, the private sector recognizes explicitly climate change is both real happening and an imperative to do something about where they need help and where we try to sort of step in is on trying to help identify what are the roadblocks to making that happen faster? How do we help them connect with existing solutions and projects or models that can be adopted, replicated, scaled, invested in? Um, and that's an opportunity for really accelerated progress and also for us to be bringing the voices of local communities in an authentic way into the conversation and giving them an immediate sort of position uh, as stakeholders. I'll mention a couple of initiatives. We're, we're really excited to be partnering with USAID and the White House Gender Policy Council on uh, an initiative that they launched at COP, uh, why, the WISE initiative, which is specifically looking at this intersection of, uh, of investment and um, uh, prioritizing uh, women in blue and green economies. So that's very exciting. And that's, uh, that's a very big sort of public-private partnership opportunity. And then we have a number of commitment makers who are already working in this space. And I'll just mention a few. Um, Fondo Acción made a commitment around creating a climate action fund for women and children in Colombia, which will support 200 grassroots initiatives across the country. So again, prioritizing immediate investment and in local stakeholders and projects. Um, Daughters for Earth made uh, a commitment to raise $50 million to 
support women-led projects fighting climate change in countries around the world. Again, looking to get that capital into, uh, into projects and, and countries uh, all around the world in a variety of ways. Um, and then we have a partner, uh, the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance, which is doing something a little different, but I think also plays into this, which is they're trying to build, um, to engage a, a sort of global community to build uh, a fund around women in climate initiatives in the Caribbean in particular, but they're really trying to harness um, some of the regional knowledge in the Caribbean and let the, the, the region actually lead that conversation and let projects and uh, a sort of gender informed perspective um, really be taking the lead in determining what the financial strategy is. So that's that's a couple of examples, but I think we are we were uh, we are pleased to see more of a discussion at the COP level and at the international level on how to prioritize women and and also girls in the thinking around and design and financing mechanisms. And we are we are hopeful that public private partnerships and more conversations like this, where we're getting diverse perspectives um, from very different types of stakeholders will be uh, a big tool in the in the toolbox of driving solutions forward. Great. Thanks so much for sharing. And I know that we are starting to, well, we've already reached time, but I um, will just go over because I want to. Um, <laughs> um, so Jacqueline, I have, and I see my Atlanta Council colleagues starting to crowd in to give me the eyes that it's time to wrap up. But so quickly, Jacqueline, we have one question from the audience. Um, the question is, how can we most effectively concentrate limited resources for impact? Dami Lola called for a focused approach by the USG. Should US aid concentrate its support as opposed to spreading it out across technologies and regions? Um, I think, I think our our current one policies, two frameworks, and the manner in which we implement makes sense. Um, we created the strategy by consulting widely internally within USAID, but also consulting with partners really to understand the hierarchy of problems in the respective locations they're in, but also really taking from lessons of development in the past to figure out what worked. And I think looking at that pro approach of one, learning and being conscious that we are constantly in an iterative process in development, but two, looking forward, understanding what the stages of development are, and three, once again, using and really taking advantage of women's voices, young girls' voices in our own programming, I think is quite important. And I think dividing that up, uh, I think just makes it potentially uh, less impactful. So when we look at energy programming, there is a gender lens to that. Just like when we look at adaptation planning, there is a gender lens to that. When we look at the work that our colleagues in the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs are doing in some of the hardest crises on earth, there is a gender angle that is applied. In addition to the, that, there is a climate angle. And so I think if you look at the work we're doing, look at it through the lens of a matrix. So large development challenge that is really underlaid with all the other really important uh, pillars that will help us get to more holistic results. When we look at our work, it's not only, you know, what are we able to achieve now, but also how are we able to shift systems and how systems operate so that in the long term, we, we really are able to ta tackle larger development challenges rather, rather than immediate problems that communities might be experiencing today. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of how we are doing what we're, what we're doing. Thanks so much. And um, we can wrap with one lightning round of questions. Um, so I'll just go to each of you. Um, but I think in the near term, what would you say needs to happen immediately to be able to ensure broader representation um, or, or more inclusive representation of women and girls and the climate decision making table? I'll start with you over there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Uh, in the near term, th that's difficult because I, I think the, the biggest solution is gender transformative education for climate, and that's more in the long term, right? Mm -hmm. We need to change the systems. But in the near term, I think we can start with creating the spaces so that the young women and girls, the people most affected, can effectively go in, have a say, and cause impact. Not go in as tokens, right, and do the high-level opening speech and leave and not being the part of the decision-making, but creating the spaces where they can be equal decision-making stakeholders at the table, because that's happening, but at a very low level, very small level, so that needs to be mainstreamed across 
climate funds across governments, city halls, everything. Tria? It could be a near term to build up to a long term. <laughs> I think it's about resourcing. Uh, because I think if you give girls and women the resources they need, they will show up at the table and they will also continue to do the hard work that they do every day. And then we need to listen and get out of the way. Sarah, we'll turn to you. I would say something very simple, which is look for the solutions when you find them, amplify them, do everything you can to give them a seat at the table. And when there are resources, direct them towards the, the people who are leading the solutions. And Jacqueline, close us out. Representation, representation, representation. Whether it's at the negotiating tables, whether it is within institutions, whether it is at the civil society level and making sure that people have platform. Social media is so powerful. There's a tool there that I think you know can really trigger a lot more action at the local level, but at the highest level, women need to be at the table where decisions are being made. Great, thanks so much. Um, Unfortunately, I'm just have to look at my notes for the closing remarks. Um, unfortunately, we've reached the end of the session, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank my t uh, colleagues who worked tirelessly in putting this event together. Um, in particular, I want to thank Jenna Ben Yehuda, who's our executive vice president, for allowing um, the women of the council at the Atlantic Council to put on this uh, event or encouraging us to. Um, and then my colleagues, Lisey Bowen, Katie Kenny, Lucero Flores, Nidhi Upadhyaya, Kate Sagar, and and the entire audio visual team um, and, and many more. So thank you all so much. Um, and the next session on titled New Beginnings, Supporting Women Immigrant Entrepreneurs to Multiply Their Impact on Economic Growth will start very shortly once we reset the stage and remike the, the next set of panelists. So thanks so much.